Well, it's amazing how the technology of snooker has evolved in recent years. We all spend the whole day watching these, well, a derivative of these. But uh, Peter, what an amazing journey and uh, how far it's come since the, the ivory. Yeah, yeah. The ivory ball, of course, was, is supposedly the improvement from a wooden ball, uh, so we believe. But the ivory is the ball that was used up until, for the professional championships, up until about 1928. Uh, so comparatively recent history we've we've moved into plastics although plastics were uh, a, a snooker ball or billiard ball uh, was one of the first things made in plastic and, and we've got a, a sort of example here this was made by the BBC up in Scotland for one of their science programs um, it's actually a wooden ball coated in uh, cellulose nitrocellulose uh, celluloid that, that sounds quite flammable because you hear all these stories about back in the old days balls would literally explode if they were hit too hard is, is that a bit of an urban myth uh, uh, an urban myth probably but with some truth behind it in that the actual balls used to be made with uh, compressed gun cotton and then coated in celluloid um, so I would imagine that any heat on them and they would actually flay, flare up on the table uh, and the story goes of course that they brought out the six guns particularly in the states you know to, to, to do it so they moved that off on the plastic and it, there was a prize given to, to to come up with a new invention to, to replace the ivory what then developed from the, the celluloid one was to, to use, going back to bone again, uh, and this is a, a crystallate a ball, when it, how it started off, um, which is bone and a cellulose compression uh, molded. And of course, you'll see that they had to break them up and grind them. From there, they moved on to a resin. Um, and the, the resin, it was a poured resin, and this is where you get to the super crystallite ball, for those people who remember it. Um, glass mold, used to just break the glass mold off and then go into a grinding machine, so you, you ended up with, a, uh, with the super crystallite ball. And, and a lot of smashed glass. And a lot of smashed glass, yeah. They actually just put it into a concrete mix and turned it upside down and ran it with a wire mesh on it. <laughs> it was an easy one to do. From there, they moved on to the a tournament champion ball, which again is still a poured resin ball. Um, and again, a sample of that there. The tournament champion balls, the standard tournament champion balls, are within three uh, grams of each other in, in the snooker set. The current modern ball, which is that one, which is, again, a tournament champion, but they are now balanced with within one gram of each other. The only problem that really gives you, and if you're in a club and you've got a Wong G set, the white ball is the one that will wear out. Um, and if, so if you go to get a replacement, you must take one of the reds with you so they can be weighed so that anybody supplying you with the ball... Wow finds one that's doing with worth within one gram. Otherwise, you're going to be playing with sets that aren't balanced. And presumably, as these, as these derivatives came on from generation to generation, the way the game was played would have changed because Absolutely. the feel of the balls, the yeah. weight, the yeah. run on the cloth, everything would have been different. Well, in fact, you've got a thing here where, where the uh, crystallite ball was probably way in the region of about 150 grams. Uh, when you went to the super crystallate, they would drop down in weight to about 140, 141 grams. Um, so the players, you know, when you've got to particularly the top players, would notice a difference. And, and they talked about the angles being different. So, yes, uh, as the things have developed, or whilst they have tried to maintain the weight to be as, e as similar to ivory as possible, uh, you've, you've lost some of that. Uh, and so the game has changed and developed. And of course, the, the, the cloth and, the, and the, the, the way the tables are now uh, produced have all had an effect. OK, you can speak for the previous generations. <laughs> I'm sure the current players would say the game is more difficult, even though the technology has, has come on in leaps and bounds. Do you think it's more difficult now than it was in the old days, or is it the other way around? I think that the quality of the equipment has improved so much that the game has developed to being a different game that was played in the old days. So the stories about Joe Davis, he, I think, claimed somewhere he had to be within about 12 inches of the ball to know that he was going to pocket it. Um, but his cue control, because of his billiards experience, probably allowed him to do it. But if you look at it, we've, in, in our collection that we've got, we've got a cue which is, I think, 143 break, which was, which was his record break. So the game has developed as the, as the products have developed. So, Stuart, the tables look so distinctive, but the cloth has, has also been on a, a journey as long as the evolution of the balls. Absolutely. The cloth has been around in its, um, in its current form uh, for, for many, many, many centuries. Um, the current cloth now is very, very different to the old coaching days cloth, which the, 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 uh, the cloth evolved from uh, coaching fabrics cl uh, derived from... Uh, uh, capes and uh, suiting from the old coaching days. 
that's where the nap came from. That's why the direction is on the cloth because uh, it used to be for the water to run off. Now, is there a specific reason why it's this shade of green, or is it purely yeah. just to make the to make the ball stand out and make it easier to? To, to make those long pots? It's historically been green. Um, there's, a, there's several theories on it. One of the, uh, the ones that I've heard is that it, it's, um, it's evolved from uh, uh, croquet. So it's, it's, a, it's a table version of uh, croquet. So it's, a, it's the color of a lawn. Ah. Well, it kind of, it, it makes sense, but it's, it's so distinctive to, uh, to look at. And how much quicker do these cloths play than the old days? Uh, significantly. The old cloths would have been anything north of 38 ounces. These are now anything from 30 to 31 ounces. So uh, quite a quite a difference in weight uh, with the the uh, reduction in thickness and the, um, the, uh, the the better uniformity of the nap. Um, we're now quite a bit quicker. So uh, probably t over 20 percent quicker than than the cloth of 10 years ago. So I, I hate to think how how different it is to the cloth from, uh, you know, 200 years ago. Are there any nuances that, that come into the game as a result of the sport being played in so many different countries with so many different types of climates? For instance, we know how many ranking events are in China and China is quite a humid country. So have you had to develop in that regard, you know, with, with, with so many different types of, uh, of climates and countries? Uh, Climate has a huge effect on the cloth. Um, humidity specifically, um, the, the fibre under a microscope will swell up with humidity um, and absorb water from the atmosphere. So humid countries like China um, will um, play slower than events in drier countries. Um, the UK is pretty much perfect. You're getting anything around a bit different today. The humidity is quite high with the rain that's going on outside, but. Uh, usually around 40% humidity, so it plays perfectly. It's ideally suited for the wool fabric. And do you think there might come a time where you would design the cloth a little differently for tables which you know would be used in China, or does it have to be the same cloth and, and, and the players just have to adapt to how it plays in different environments? Um, I don't know is the answer to that. It's, uh, the cloth as it is now has been um, a, a sort of work in progress for the last 20 years. I mean, there's a lot of experts at the uh, World Snooker who have helped us and worked with us to develop it to what the players want today. Um, we can we can make it quicker, we can make it slower, we can make it faster, we can we can do whatever. But at the moment, I think these um, at this year's championships are not far from perfect. Okay, seems a basic question, and it is. But uh, I ask it because not everyone will know. What is this actually made of? Where where does it come from, and and how do you go from having it on a yarn to putting it on the table? Um, all our cloths that we produce, um, traditional wool and snooker cloths are 100% wool. Um, the wool that we use comes from Australia um, and we select years in advance for um, fibre thickness and diameter and length which give you the optimum playing conditions. So it's all sheep wool. Wow, and why in particular Australian sheep? Uh, do they have a certain kind of Texture? Yeah, it's the climate um, and uh, the, the, the availability. I mean, there are a lot of sheep in Australia um, and the climate is right to give you the right thickness of wool. UK wools tend to be used more in carpet because um, they're a bit, bit, bit coarser, a bit, bit wirier. Um, you know, these are very fine wools that are used in these billiard cloths. Wow. So, well, Neil Robertson would certainly, uh, would certainly uh, enjoy the fact that uh, it's travelled from uh, down under. It's uh, sure would, yeah. a complicated process. Thanks very much. No, thank you. Well, Pete, you've got a fairly enormous Air Miles account because you travel across the globe making sure that these tables are ready for the world-class action on the various continents. First of all, pocket sizes. A lot of people uh, want to know, are the pockets different on different tables in different countries? Um, not in tournament play, they're exactly the same. I mean, um, pocket opens have evolved over the years. I mean, this is my 34th World Championship, you know. Uh, you're just showing off now. Yeah, well, I started when I was five. But, um, and the actual pocket openings, although they evolved in the 80s and were slightly altered direct, um, on tournament play through the 80s, the actual pocket size and everything else hasn't altered since 1990. Because people do say, oh, this table plays differently, the pockets must be a different size, but you can confirm that as far as ranking tournaments are concerned, 
It's exactly the same. It's exactly the same. We don't just put the table up and say, away we go. We have people and officials come in who check levels, check this, check that, and then check every pocket opening to the authorised templates. So they, they give you no leeway. When you come to set up tables at a ranking event, how long does it actually take to, to, to ensure that the table is absolutely ready for the players? Well, it's a completely different scenario at the tournament because if you go to a private house or a, a club, you arrive in the morning, probably be there five, six hours and finish the table. In the, in the conditions with tournaments, because you have to allow for settlement, and when the event starts, the table has to be at optimum playing performance. You have to do it over a period of time. So you'll go in, you'll wreck the frame, you'll put the slates on, you'll rough level it, you'll let it settle for 24 hours, and you'll come back, level it again, and then you'll finish the table, fit the cloth, do the pocket openings and templates, and then an official will come in, you know, um, in, in most cases, Martin Clark, an ex uh, uh, professional player, and then he'll play shots all over the table, dead weight, to check the levels and pocket openings. And that, so it's normally over about two, two and a half days. So bearing that in mind, when you go from a two-table setup to a one-table setup at the Crucible, you're, you're having to do a lot of work in a very short space of time, and it absolutely has to be right because it's the, it's the sport's showpiece showdown of the season. Yeah, well, you're absolutely correct. I mean, it's not just it's not just the snooker table that moves. I mean, if you take the World Championships, you go from two tables then to one. You, that means you've got two lighting rigs. One has to be taken round, one has to be centralised, two tables. So we have to go in, remove all our tables. Then the lighting people go in, remove the lighting, centralise it. And then we go back in and then centralise the table and start again. And we, and we normally... It uh, normally takes about eight hours from when the brass ball potted to when we, we finish the table and it's signed off. And are different arenas more difficult to work in? Because one of the things that makes the Crucible such a, a great cauldron for snooker is that you know the arena floor is sunken beneath the first level of spectators. It's more like a coliseum than an arena. But does that make it more difficult, the fact that the floor tends to move and bend when you're walking on on the crucible floor you can feel it move underneath you it used to be in the past because what we used to have to do because you've got that 12 foot gap from the floor to the actual basement up to about the two three years ago what we'd have to do was to put an acro prop on the floor downstairs on, a, on you know on the eight legs and then you'd turn the acro prop till it got the weight and then you'd level it but uh, three years ago the crucible was completely renovated and the floor was replaced with this module system and it is so good it is so Although you feel movements, you know, um, I mean, when we had the tables passed off here, we've virtually done no alterations. The floor is really good for level. Wow. And I guess a very basic question, but one that club players would, would like to know the answer to. What are the differences in terms of how a table plays in a major championship to the, to the local five or six uh, tables that they'll have in their club next to their bar? Uh, well, there's, there's a few things. Pocket openings are a lot harder. They're very difficult, though. People seem to think they're, they're, you know, the professional make it look so easy, but they're so difficult. Obviously, the, the strong cloth, you know, it's uh, a, a very sharp number 10. Um, obviously, the cloth is quite new all the time. We, we, uh, yeah, we recover the cushions every four days, so there's no wear on the cushions. And, you know, the, the general playing conditions are so much better. Plus, we have, you know, a core heating table system where it keeps a temperature at a certain, uh, keeps a table at a certain temperature. And it's so efficient, we can, you know, if it's rain outside, we can go in to turn up five degrees and it, it's up to that temperature within half an hour because you're looking for an ambient temperature on the top, you know of sort of 21 to 23 degrees. So Pete, one of the most important things from all players at all levels, pocket sizes. Just explain how you use this, uh, these pieces of kit to ensure that it's a level playing field. Right, okay, well, well these are the pocket templates and there's f four forms, uh, two that control the corners and two that control the middles. And basically what you're looking at is that this one template controls the top cut. So you slide it in and it has to fit in very snugly because the front of the template is slightly bigger, so it pulls in and there's no movement and has to follow the form exactly, which is quite important. But this is, a, this is really the important template, <coughs> Sorry, which is, which is called the undercut template. This controls two factors. The first factor being the amount of rubber ah. that is removed. Because obviously, you know, because the ball is cylindrical, the more, the more rubber you remove from under here, the easier the pocket. These are what we call maximum undercut. You couldn't make these any harder because the rubber section is only that wide. It also controls the slate fall. You know, 
So th there's the slate fall. So that means when the, half the ball gets over that point, it has to go in the pocket. So the further the slate fall in the pocket, the harder the, the pocket. That's why you virtually have to be 100% when you come down. Because the, if we were to make these any further into slate, you would never pot a ball down the cushion.